uh, the, the tracker is so you just look at the paper and exactly what it is on screen. But we can also make it more complex by giving um, user interaction using program rules. And it can be as simple as just correcting user inputs. For example, um, if you put in some information that is not correct, um, the system will then respond and say, you know, this is not the correct range, for example, blood pressure, et cetera. Um, and you can also go into something a lot more complex, which is clinical decision support, where if you enter the blood pressure and it's really high, and the system also looks at other um, characteristics of the client, they can say, for example, in our ANC program, they can say, for example, um, this client we suspect has chronic hypertension, so please refer her to the next level of care for, um, for management of chronic hypertension. Or for example, if the system recognizes that um, for antenatal care, if the system recognizes that this woman did not have um, uh, hypertension when she started her pregnancy and now has it, the system will then say, hey, this woman actually developed hypertension while she was pregnant. So this is gestational hypertension and please refer her or give her this particular support. So that becomes a lot more complex. We can also have client messaging with SMS and you can have just generic messaging that sends a message to everybody saying, hey, you know, um, we uh, antenatal care is available at, um, at this and that clinic or antenatal care is um, you, you should take care um, of yourself during antenatal care. You should take your folic acid, et cetera. So that's just, you know, blanket messaging. Or you can have targeted client messaging, which is more specific based on client information that has been entered into the system. For example, you can send a message to a particular client telling her, um, the last time you came, uh, you were identified as having chronic hypertension. So we want to make sure that you come for your next appointment on such and such a date um, uh, at this particular clinic where we will check your blood pressure and advise you on what to do to make sure that your child does not suffer any consequences from your chronic hypertension. So this is where the system takes information about that specific client and also about the org unit where the client was registered and sends information to the client about her specific case. And of course, we know that the more targeted SMS messages are, the more likely people are going to respond to it. Um, so, you know, the more complex you have, um, the more results you potentially can get. But of course, complexity involves um, also means a lot more work. We also have feedback dashboards where you can do it by org unit um, or you can do it by the user, um, you know, the, the particular clinic or the particular health worker and tell her, hey, you know, you are supposed to screen, screen every client who comes in for blood pressure, for antenatal care. We want to make sure that our chronic hypertension numbers are managed. And so you can send, um, you can provide that user with a dashboard showing her that out of all the clients you saw this month, you only screened 30% for um, chronic hypertension. And we can also give what we call action items and say, hey, you know, uh, make sure that you increase this number um, by making it part of your routine or make sure that if you have a problem with your, um, your blood pressure equipment, if that's the problem, then please contact your supervisor. So then the more complex the, um, the tracker program is, the more targeted it is to either the user or the client. And we know that based on um, health behavior, the more specific data that you get is, the more specific it is to you, the more likely you are to work. So again, as I said, the complexity, um, you then have to counter that with coverage and skill, because if you have um, high coverage, you might not be able to be as um, complex as you would want to be, because that requires a lot of management. And we can also look at Android versus web, or in some um, projects, we use both. So I will now move on to Looking at this graphic, which you potentially have seen um, earlier in the um, in this uh, academy, which shows the interaction between coverage and complexity. So the higher you go in coverage, right, um, the uh, most likely, like for example, this uh, this Ghana MCH program has very high coverage but very low complexity.
And that usually is what happens. Um, this also has um, high, high coverage, but has actually been able to achieve um, high complexity. And I know that the TB program in Ghana has required a lot of work in order to achieve that. Then you have an example of high complexity, but low coverage, which is Ghana using um, uh, Ghana's ART HIV um, tracker program. So exactly um, as I discussed before, the complexity of the tracker configuration can go from people on screen to very complex functionality like feedback dashboards, interactions with users and program rules. So when we look at some key considerations like scale, um, you know, you have tracker has a possibility of reaching all levels of an organization. And that um, also increases, if you go, um, if you really increase scale, that increases the number of users, devices, and support requirements. So that's something to take to think about when you're trying to scale up. If, for example, you start a project, a uh, pilot project in a district, and you want to go nationwide, you have to consider um, increased costs like devices, training, and support. Um, if you are trying to do scale, you should probably consider reduced complexity because you have so many users who you have to train and you have to support and you also have system maintenance. One of the biggest issues with tracker and going to, um, going to scale, national scale, et cetera, is the user support and the training. You have to, for every person that you train, previously if you had you know, aggregates, you just need to support maybe the the data manager, one data manager at a facility, or even when um, data was done at the district level, aggregate um, data was done at the district level, you just needed to support that one um, district health um, data manager. Now you have every single nurse who, you know, could lose their phone, could, um, have problems with um, their login, who didn't come up for part of the training, who has um, doesn't have enough data or has some problem, she doesn't know why it is. So um, this is why we say when you are looking at increased complexity, um, increased scale, you probably should consider reduced complexity because you're going to make sure that everybody understands this level of complexity. Then um, we have to look at Android versus web if you're trying to decide what type of implementation that you want to do. And in some contexts in low and middle income countries, we know that we have challenges with internet access. So um, that is something to consider if you um, are having serious challenges with internet access, it might be a good idea to use Android. But Android also means that you can have a tremendous number of devices, right? If you have a tablet, it usually just goes to one person, or if you have a phone, it usually goes, goes to one person. Um, but if you have a laptop, you know, it's maybe it's at the facility and everybody uses it, et cetera. Um, you can also, you also have to think about the technical literacy of the users and the amount of data collected on Android. Um, Android also has challenges with complex systems which have a lot of program rules. And um, in front of some of the implementations that I have done, we had um, we designed primarily for um, the web and then we realized on Android that it was quite a challenge because even though the Android users were not using that complexity, the program rules existed and would run and was quite a burden for Android users. So is that something to consider? When you're developing your, um, your, your system, make sure you test both on Android and web to make sure that the beautiful complex system you designed works um, well on both systems. Then one of the key issues is real-time versus secondary data entry. Um, my, in um, at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, as I mentioned, uh, we use the e-registry, which is the most complex form of, um, of the tracker and it involves real-time data entry because our primary goal is to give decision support to the health worker, most, most of the time midwives, while the client is there so that if you enter blood pressure, I will, the system will be able to tell you this person is, hypoten is hypertensive. And so we require that it is done while the client is there in real time. Um, so as, we, as I said here, real-time data collection provides opportunities for decision support, data validation, and it guides health workers in the data entry and clinical processes. Um, but 
you sometimes might need to change secondary data entry. And why would you do that? You could have a problem of bad connectivity or power at the point of care. So you might then have to do data entry at a later stage. And we have that, for example, in the Bangladesh National MCH Tracker. Um, we, in, um, in we, we did an implementation in Bangladesh where some um, facilities did not have power. So they basically would leave their, or it was just really bad internet. So they would leave their laptops at home and then they would take their registers with them home and then enter the data later. Um, also, secondary data entry gives you a lot more flexibility. You can afford to have some system downtime or unreliability. So if you are doing a complex system or you don't have the resources for somebody to respond really quickly, that is an option to think about because, you know, for example, for you know, weekly data entry, or data entry that's done at the end of the day, you know, you can have some flexibility if the data doesn't get entered, you know, right um, within uh, 24 hours, for example, if you have a weekly data entry. Um, you have a reduced number of devices and health workers who have to be trained, and that is a reduced cost. Because if you're doing secondary data entry, you can have a data manager who just sits and gets all the data from all the nurses, the midwives at that facility. And at the end of the day, they just enter it. So it's just one device that you need and one person that you need to train and support. Then um, if you're only entering a subset um, um, of data from the paper register into the tracker, so that you still need some paper data, then you might consider um, secondary data entry because you are not getting rid of paper, right? So then you should, you might as well um, have the health worker, you know, write on paper if they can, if they can enter into the system at the same time how the, health, the client is there, that's fine. But they do need to write in, if they do need to write in, um, in the register information that does not go into the tracker, then you can be more flexible and say, hey, if you have bad connectivity while the client is there or if the client is, you know, needs more care, you can just take a break and not enter the data there. Just make sure you write it in the paper register. And then later at the end of the day, you can enter it. If you're doing a transition from paper to electronic, um, that is a very um, tedious process. It involves um, a lot of change management. And so you might want to do secondary data entry to really help the transition be smooth. Um, people obviously, um, a lot of countries do not want to do paper because they don't want to do only electronic because they don't trust the data. So then if you choose secondary data entry by somebody who is really good, you can then produce the data to the powers that be and make sure that it's good and that will help um, you know, the transition. If your system is only used for reporting and there's no decision support needed or involved, then there's no point in doing um, you know, point of care really um, because that is really expensive in both the devices, the support, the trainer, et cetera. So if you're just using it for reporting, then, and there's no user interaction, you can just hire a data manager for them to put the information in. You're just using the tracker so that you get individual level data. Um, if you are just using it also for generating appointments or supporting such, you know, these type of work processes that do not involve the clients physically being there, you can also just enter the data at the end of the day. And then, you know, the SMS then sends the client's information later on that, hey, you have your appointment coming up. So anything that um, is you don't need it, um, any sort of user interaction during the, um, the data entry, then you can safely choose secondary data entry. Now, there are two types of secondary data entry, depending on who does the secondary data entry. You can have the data entered by the same health worker who wrote the information on paper, or you can have data entered by a different health worker who was going to write and enter it from paper to electronic. So when it's a different health worker, it usually is what we, you know, what we often refer to as the data managers or the data clerks. So why would you choose a secondary data entry by another health worker? So you can have, that enables you to have dedicated data entry clerks 
and that helps to reduce the data entry burden on the skilled health worker. If you have a midwife who is busy, you know, giving clinical support to health workers, she does not want to be bothered by, you know, um, entering the data at the end of the day. If there's somebody who is less skilled, they can do it. After all, you can, you know, maybe have only one access to two um, midwives in a sub-district, but I mean, you can always find um, five people who have some basic IT skills or train them to do that. So you want to protect your skilled health workers and make them focus on doing the clinical specialized um, training work that they have been trained on. Um, if your clinical work, health worker has inadequate or low tech skills for doing data entry, we had this challenge in a Bangladesh um, e-registry implementation pilot that we did at uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, where the, um, the midwives are people who have been in the system for a really, really long time. They, a lot of them were actually on the verge of retirement. And so they had no interest in trying to learn this new skill and so, um, you know, that was quite a challenge for us in trying to figure out how to get them to do um, data entry. So if you have such, uh, um, if your focus is um, antenatal care and you need the data that a midwife is entering and you don't need, um, you know, clinical decision support, you might consider having the data entry being done by um, someone else because otherwise your implementation can be challenged by um, low data entry because this health worker just cannot. Uh, she doesn't have the time, she doesn't, um, she doesn't have the skills and you spend so much time training her, you might as well give it to a younger, less, um, less clinically skilled but more technically skilled person. You can also look at the volume of patients and the workflow and see how it makes it challenging to do real-time data entry. So for example, in Bangladesh, we chose the community um, level clinics. They don't have huge volumes of people. So you can take your time and enter the data into the system while the client is there. You might want to avoid um, real-time data entry if you are at a hospital you know, at a district level or higher, you know, um, at a, um, a higher level of care where you have high volumes, you just, you know, may not um, want a, the, the person who's doing the care to take on that burden as well. But you also have to take notes on some people may lose their jobs if the same health worker is doing data entry. You know, you have all these data clubs who might then become um, obsolete, but actually, you could repurpose them to be the technical support to the health workers because you know most of the time the health workers are not as tech savvy. So you could repurpose them to be technical support. They um, because again, as we said, for track implementations, if you want to go to scale, you need a lot of people to give you the support for the many um, users that you now have. So if you, even if you have data entry by the health worker you can use these um, data clerks to then you know, train them to then be the technical support for um, the health workers. So we have some challenges with secondary data entry by a different health worker. You can have issues with errors. The person can read the writing. They usually are not um, you know, clinical staff, so they don't understand some of the technical terms. And sometimes they are not skilled enough to recognize errors. You know, somebody's handwriting may make the blood pressure be four digits, or it will look like four digits. And this, you know, second, this um, different health worker, usually the data clerk, will not recognize it and just, you know, put in four digits. And if you don't have an inbuilt um, program rule that detects um, the correct range of blood pressure, that error is going to go in. Um, you also have that the health workers don't have ownership of the system and therefore they don't trust the reports that are generated by the data entry clerks. Um, I remember when I used to work in Ghana, um, you know, you go to meetings and the clinical, the, you know, the data people present their, um, what has been done and it shows that, you know, um, let's say the maternal unit is not um, doing as well 
And then the pental unit shows up and says, we are doing very well. We, you know, in our clinics, we know that we have done this and this and that. And therefore, you know, the problem is with these people who are entering data. We don't know how they enter the data. We don't have any insight into it. So that's not a problem. And therefore, how do you then proceed? If you, you don't have, you cannot convince the people who are actually doing the work that there is a challenge that they have to address then you will never achieve your goals. Um, you always will have problems with your donors and supporters. So there are certain mitigating measures that you can take. You can create option sets to reduce errors from typing in data. Um, you, can do, you can train the people who are entering the data to give them some um, clinical training for them to better understand the clinical data that they are entering so that they can more easily recognize errors. You should also have a robust validation procedures, some of them built in while you're doing data entry and some of them done you know, at the end of data entry. There are different uh, validation um, features within DHIS2. Then you should also have a process for the skilled staff who generated the information, the milk wife, et cetera, to review the data before final submission. And so that at the end of the day, when all the data has been aggregated to the national level, they then can't come and say, you know, I have no idea why our indicators are so low. Um, I don't have anything to do with it. No, you signed off on every piece of data that was entered into the system. So if we look at real-time point of care data entry, so these are some of the key considerations that you have to consider to decide if you're actually going to do that. It has to work all the time. It has to work all the time because the health worker is using it while the client is there. Um, and if they are having challenges with it, you know, the clients will become frustrated, the health worker will become frustrated, and you are going to have clients not coming back and your healthcare indicators are going to go down. You have to have reliable power and you have to have um, good internet connectivity so that it is working all the time. You are going to have increased costs, as we mentioned, if every single health worker has to have, um, is dealing with the patient, they have to have their own device because if you have three patients who are seen by three different health workers at the same time, you need to have three devices as opposed to before when the, all the three health workers were just right on paper and then at the end of the day, the one you know, um, data clerk enters the data. You have your users that you have to train, um, more users that you have to support, and um, you know that is a lot of work and that is a lot to um, to consider. So when you think of all these challenges, why would you choose real time um, point of care data instead of um, you know instead of secondary data um, entry? So it's because it provides um, user interaction, right? Um, and if you need, for example, clinical decision support, if the reason why you are doing this particular um, type of, of um, implementation, this complexity of implementation is because your health workers are not following the clinical guidelines. They have them in books, but it's difficult for them to refer to those books when the client is in front of them. So if you have it built in as they're entering the data, then you are sure that everybody is following the same rules and following the same clinical guidelines that you are doing, that you, the country has um, decided on. And also for that particular cadre of health workers. Um, you have program rules that guide data entry to help reduce data entry errors. You have data validation right there. You don't now have when the data gets to the district level and then they realize, oh, there's a problem and they have to trace who actually entered it, et cetera. You, um, if a client tells you information that you didn't hear correctly and you put into the system, the system can then point out to you and say, wait, this doesn't seem right. You, uh, the client's date of birth that you entered makes her 11 years old and um, you know this person is supposed to have had chronic hypertension. I mean, there are people who can have um, who can be 11 and, and pregnant, but let's say, you know, somebody showed up and is, uh, you've entered 60 um, instead of 16, for example, um, they can just prompt you and say, hey, are you sure? It's unlikely that a pregnant woman will be 60. And then you can, you know, you can make sure that um, that is entered correctly. If the person actually is 60, which does happen, then you can go ahead. But at least that um, buffer is there to make sure that you reduce the data entry errors. 
Um, if you have actions that you want the health worker to do based on the clinical information that they entered, for example, if you want to generate um, risks and tell the health worker about it so that she you know, counsels the client or makes a certain decision, you have, as I keep mentioning with blood pressure, if you enter the blood pressure and um, the client, then the system can tell that the client has hypertension. If you put in, um, you know, um, data that, for example, the baby is breech, um, you can have the system tell you that this client has to deliver in the hospital. Um, and you can then decide that the client, the system can also tell you that you need to refer this client immediately or within a week, you know, depending on what the situation is, to the next level of care. Or this client, you know, has to deliver at the next level of care and not at the community because, you know, her situation is so complex. Um, so it gives you all these recommended patient management actions. And if you're doing secondary data entry, by the time this information gets to you, you know, the person is gone, right? The person, the help, the client who was supposed to get this information is gone. So that's one of the reasons why we would have um, real time point of care data. And you can also have SMSs that the client needs to get during the visit if you needed to, but you know, usually that is not that common. Um, it usually is about um, health risk referrals and recommended patient management actions. So let's take a break for questions before I go on to the e-registry and the clinical decision supports.